Welcome back to Conversations and Catapults, Funeral for a Frenemy Edition. Oh. I am your host, Nathan, <laughs> and today I am joined by the sweetest sorrowers at the wake. Say hello, sweetest sorrowers. Hi, my name is Ben, and I'm currently crying right now from <laughs> what we just experienced not too long ago. Uh, and I play the level six gnome wizard, Windsor Wallaby, on the hit podcast, Trials and Trebuchets. Not true. Liar. What? Liar. <gasps> I'm a liar? How, how, what? We You're, got because you play No one told me. Level. You play a level seven <laughs> gnome wizard. No one told me. Wins them all. <laughs> <laughs> you figured it out because you're such a whiz kid. I did it. Hey. Oh my God, I'm smart. <laughs> hi. Hi, everyone. It's me, Carla. <laughs> and I play the level seven <laughs> tiefling roadblock <laughs> integrity Adelberry. With it, I don't know, Adelberry. But she's not here with me right now. Soon. Guys, I promise it's fine. I'm fine. It's okay. I'm Sarah, and I play Mira Marchand, the level seven half elf, half elf bard. Standing in the dis in the distance from the wake, under a tree with the dark umbrella <laughs> and sunglasses on, looking like they're hiding the biggest <laughs> secret of their goddamn life, is Sarah Neff Sinderman, <laughs> played by me, Sam. Sarah Neff Sinderman is a level seven human sorceress and could have had something to do with a murder. <gasps> I believe it. I can see that happening. <laughs> who is this crashing the funeral? Yeah, who the hell is this who chump? Is... <laughs> I'm Oh my god, is that, is, is that Luke's that music? Oh, hi. I'm, I see. I'm Luke and I killed her and also died. And I killed her and also died. <laughs> you died. Like and that's that. what you say at the wake. So what you're saying is you're the murderer. Yes, murdered and murderer. We finally found Whoa. the answer to the murder mystery party. After so <laughs> many did. episodes. That's right. that's right, everyone. Um, Due to this being the end of an arc, we have decided to gather everyone into one big recording to talk about that fucking ending, though, right? Yeah. I mean, no that's kidding. the first mm -hmm. question, right? Oh, golly. How is everyone doing? Is everyone okay? Emotionally? Traumatized. Thanks eh. for asking. We were okay. <laughs> yeah, but what about your character? Eh. Traumatized. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Honestly, I'm feeling great. You know? Like I have. <laughs> uh, liar. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I definitely believe that there is a uh, reason for integrity to be incredibly sad about this. I think all of us are sad in a way, maybe for different yeah. reasons. Um, but I don't feel very good. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stark, I don't feel very good. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> yeah. For Mira, it's very much like it's not that she thought Ferdinand was a good mm. person, but it's a combination of like, you know, she looked like me for a second and that like that kind of messes with your perception of anyone. But it's also just very much more this sense of like I made a promise to keep you alive and I couldn't keep it. Especially if you think about like Mira, like with having like Dane, you know, she tries to save Dane, doesn't work. So yep. Mira sort of has a history there of like, I'm trying to help this person. I think that she feels a little bit guilty about Teb too, because she sort of went along with leaving. Thing. And so even though Ferdinand wasn't the best person, I think that Mira feels a little bit of guilt over like, e even if I could, it could just be like one person whose life mm -hmm. I could save and like who to whom I could keep a promise, that would be better. I think if there's one word to use for how Serenep is feeling about the whole thing, it's just complicated. There were so many different emotions about Ferdinand as a person and the situation that they had been put into because of Ferdinand escaping death in the first place. Mm. So... She hasn't had time to unpack that yet. Uh, coming off of those complicated feelings, I want to start off with the hardest question that I have for my play, not for my players. For <laughs> players. What's happening? Uh, You're taking over now? <laughs> I, no, I'm, I'm, listen, uh, Luke and I have worked out a system where at the end of an arc, we switch off uh, and it's just totally different. <laughs> we we didn't, the Luke voice for the whole did time. You not, did you not get the memo? We we were specifically, it was specifically stated that we were merging and that you were being, getting replaced. Yeah, this I is what the timeline convergence is. I, I already we sent all my guys. notebooks and stuff. This feels like uh, I'm just going to my dad's house for uh, the weekend again. <laughs> <laughs> the hardest question that I have for you all, meaning the players, is do you think you did the right thing? Follow up, do you think there was a right thing to do? I think we did the best that we could given the circumstances. Yeah, like I like a, I said in the episode, which I don't know if it got cut out or not, like at that time, like it was very much a survivalist instinct of I have to do whatever I can to get out of this with the least amount of damage possible. And so like, I don't think... We did the wrong thing. I don't think we did the right thing either. I think 
we did this at a very biased standpoint. And like Sarah did, like we said, like we we did the best that we could given the circumstances. I think as for the right thing. Okay, so it could be like in terms of the entire scenario. And with that, I again, like what they were saying, it's hard to really determine what the right thing and the wrong thing was. It was all survival instincts at that point. Um, But there is definitely like a decision that Carla (laughs) continues to like plague herself with. And that is whether or not I should have brought up that she was untying herself Mm. if that was the right decision um for integrity to do because i was trying to give it give the in my head i'm like i'm saying that i'm not gonna fight you like i'm not going to stab you or i'm not going to like punch you for trying to run away but if i let you just go then the thing that will allow us to like survive might be gone and that's not just my life but my friend's life as well so it's like that kind of thing so i don't know if that specific thing is right or wrong but and not to mention the lives of everyone who is being held captive by loud um you all had to consider their lives milan like was one of those people <laughs> did nothing you know, wrong i don't know right? how you feel about milan we weren't like, in italy hey, i love milan <laughs> Milan, Milan, oh my melon. God! <laughs> is it really melon? It melon. Is melon. I've only been reading it for the like longest. The melon, <laughs> like the fruit, it's like the the, me- All right, like the melon. Let me, let me, let me go back then. Excuse me. Yeah, you also had to consider the lives of like the captives. You know, like uh, Milan. <laughs> um, oh my God! <laughs> what about Malone? Malone. It's Malone. Uh, yep. There was that bush. Uh, true. <laughs> and. This leads into a question that I have for Luke. Luke. Oh, yeah. There is a semi-common sentiment that you can see online in like DM circles, which is at a certain point, uh, some DMs don't actually think of a solution to a problem that they throw to their players. Mm -hmm. And they just want to see what the players come up with. Mm. Do you think there is like an optimal way of getting out of this? Did you have one in mind? I I had, well, here's the, the way that I prepare things is, I know how things will go without intervention, right? And the joy of playing is seeing how that changes. Because it's typically always way more fun to see what the, they, the players, it's weird talking about them in the abstract now. I like don't, I can't look at them because normally we <laughs> make record this without them Hi, here. we're here also. So I can just be like, oh, <laughs> those players over there, right? Disconnected. But th- 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 these shucks, schmucks, um, I love seeing what they do to the draft of a story that i write um which is to say i didn't there's no optimal solution um the optimal solution for fun for me would have been if so many other things got discussed right like i'm so glad that they brought up nesca right because that was like a little point i had of like this will be a point that like someone will take note of Uh, and there was other conversation there are other things that they could have mentioned that would have had a similar effect that just didn't. So this is the way that it went and it was very good. Um, Ferdinand getting out would have been hilarious. I, I think I told this to, to the players. <laughs> I don't remember if we said this, we had this conversation right after we finished recording about I called the arc trading places because, and yes. you can very <laughs> much catch by the tone of the first half of the arc what I intended <laughs> for this arc, which was it was going to be silly and lighthearted to the to a point with like oh we all want that dang witch ah and like dumb frogs yeah, and she's like bugs bunny yeah and then she was <laughs> going to steal some skins as soon as they untie her in grung town which i that's why if you go listen to those episodes Ferdinand's just going please untie me please untie me please untie me because me as luke was like please <laughs> fucking untie this i want to like, i want this so bad please, please give don't it to make me this right a sad storyline we don't trust her so the more she says it the i know i know it. It. that's the joy of it um and so at that point they were she was like gonna steal skins with her bath bomb and then it would be like essentially just like chase her through the plane and maybe beyond that right that was my original lighthearted intent with the arc genuinely lighthearted and then it came here um and it got uh yeah harsh um let's, let's confront our inevitable mortality we want we want fucking grimdark and trauma <laughs> yeah it, it went to now, a i think fun place 
Um, I agree. Fun no, place. <laughs> <laughs> fun comes in many Trauma, shapes and sizes. development of type <laughs> two fun. Type two fun. Yeah, it's the first three letters of funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Levity four. <laughs> Levity four. If you didn't get that joke, join the Trials and Tribuches Discord. Anywho, I also have a follow up to that then. Like, with that in mind, this is a question for everyone here. If you could go back and do something differently in the whole arc, what would you do differently? Have Mira explicitly codify to Loud in the deal that he was not allowed to cut off her head <laughs> or anything that would have prevented her from doing the thing that she agreed to do. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Probably not grow the plant door. Mm. Mm. Oh. And then try and set fire in a magical book. Specifically the the one in Grungtown, Ben, because you grew- the one in Grungtown. Okay, because you grew you grew two of them. One in the under campus or at Wildcliff, and one in in Grungtown in the marsh, moistest mm-hmm. marsh. Any like specific reason why, or just like just that way loud couldn't uh, get there as quickly or what? Probably because in that case, I think we would have had to confront our problems more yeah. head on instead of. Mm. Like running around in circles on a wild goose chase to, to whatever sanctuary mm-hmm. we might have needed to go to, it would have been a lot crazier and probably would have led down the path of like, we're going to swap skins now. Yeah. And then the whole story mm. continues from there. I, I follow you. like the, 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 the door going down and you guys just running out. I didn't, int- it's this thing that Sarah already mentioned of like, I was keying in on as Ferdinand being like, on timey, on timey, on timey. And then so the second that she was like, there's this place and we can get sanctuary there and integrity and mirror are like sounds cool let's go i was like oh wow really that easy huh right <laughs> um which unexpected and then you just it was vamoosed through the door so yeah carla sam do you all have anything or do you think you did everything right <laughs> Oddly enough, the only thing that really has stuck in my head was the fact that we didn't pay the mall toll. <laughs> you super didn't. You <laughs> absolutely like did not pay big... the mall toll. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why that's the thing I'm focused on after everything that's happened. Because mm-hmm. I feel like everything that happened at the loft, I wouldn't change that. Sarah Neps was under pressure. I was under pressure trying to figure out a solution to things. Yep. Like, I was basically working off my emotions. There wasn't really another yeah. way for it to go that way. My one thing is the mole toll. I wish... <laughs> I don't That's know. We're going to go back there again, then they're going to be the big boss. I don't know. I follow you. That's... <laughs> That's interesting to me. It's like being on your deathbed and being like, oh, I didn't pay those parking tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hand them down to you, my child. <laughs> <laughs> Hands a parking think- ticket to Virgil. <laughs> oh, I but- think one regret I have is not taking the time to ask Ferdinand to get my bag of holding. <laughs> <laughs> and you also because I can't machine. say that I regret being like... Uh, like the thing that I was talking about earlier, um, I, I don't think that it's something that I should really regret. It it led to a different outcome that I wish did not happen, which is like have her beheaded. Mm. Um, but uh, <laughs> you know, I bet like if she got loose, Loud would do the same thing, even mm. with or without my warning. Is my thinking? Maybe I don't know. Mm. Who knows? But. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of the beheading, uh, Luke, we briefly touched on this before recording. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk to you about um, that whole situation. Yeah. Which is <laughs> like this. Um, sometimes when you are a, a dungeon master or running mm-hmm. any sort of game and your players come with, with a like creative solution mm-hmm. to what seems to be an unwinnable situation, mm-hmm. which was... To me, the revivify like idea. All right, that seemed to solve everyone. Took care of them. Fantastic. Like everyone wins except for Ferdinand, who still wins by getting to come back to life. Yes. And then going for cutting off the head, which you knew would would keep her from being revived. Mm-hmm. Was that a you decision or was that a loud decision? I, I think a thousand percent over. That's a loud decision. He's a a, a violent, uh, angry slad. We we know that in in canon that these creatures don't let people live, right? Like the knowledge Serenepth and Integrity, I think, have on these creatures is that we know they exist. People have gone out to try to research them. No one comes back, right? So we and then even just in dealing with Loud, 
he wants to like he asks Mira and Winsler in the lift ride up to the loft oh Wildcliff right because they mentioned it offhandedly that we're from Wildcliff study group right and that was like checking in because he had a grudge with them and was going to show up to kill them right like he he killed Ferdinand the entire point of this is Ferdinand gave him a plum pudding and then he chased her across the plains and killed her and then tried to do it again and succeeded right so I feel like it's utterly in line I think their solution of kill her revivify her let her live a few years think on that experience and then she can go off to hell um is a beautiful solution you can hear my reaction in episode 120 of like just as soon as sarah or mira goes i learned about this in class and i go like oh i love that reaction um, it seemed like everyone was going wild at the table over like this horrifying it's idea it's so good it's an amazing plan i it's a very good plan um and yeah i think that loud it's not like Mira's like, I will cast exactly the spell Revivify up upon her. She's That's just like, true. I'll bring her back from the dead. So Loud's like, all right, I'll just fucking kill her then. Ah, uh, sick. I can do this any way I want. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I gotcha. That that makes sense to me. Um, like, in the moment, I was like, man, that doesn't feel good because, like, mm-hmm. I was rooting for the players. You know, I wanted them to get away mm-hmm. with this. I, 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 uh, did that feel unfair to the four of you? The beheading? No. Yeah. Um, mm. I do Did you feel like that was me going out of my way to like No. No. Okay. No. Because okay. Slad is a bad, bad Slad. <laughs> Here I yeah. still Slad, that's a like, great that's a great rhyme. Loud probably <laughs> Loud probably knows the workings around Revivify, so it wouldn't surprise me if he tried to like pull something out of his sleeve and just mm-hmm. cut her head off so that yeah. it wouldn't work. Because loud, that, loud, seem, that yeah. seems like the kind of person Loud is. Loud is smart. We we hate smart villains. I just found it crazy that like after it was okay, we've established that the way the execution happened was cutting off the head, mm. and we have just been told that mm. casting this spell would not like reattach the limbs to each other. <laughs> Mira still cast the spell I loved on it. the yeah. on was, the head that was basically. A Mira I knew yeah. as Sarah that it wasn't going to work, but I yeah. think that Mira in the moment. Try. What she tried, she yeah. didn't learn that in oh, class. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I think it's the same thing you exactly. talked about with like the Dane situation, right? Where it's like uh, you couldn't do anything then. You tried to use healing magic then. You tried to use the tools in your mm-hmm. toolbox then to no avail. Yes. I don't see why this would be any any different to like mm-hmm. m- maybe beyond a shadow of a hope. Sarah made actually a really good proposal that uh, I wish... I wish I had a thought of in the moment, which was the <laughs> yes that Ferdinand be re- or be brought back from the dead, but just her head is alive. Oh my god! <laughs> and so then we have this sassy witch head, and that would have been outstanding. Um, would it have worked if I took out my sewing kit? <laughs> oh, well, if you my cast god. mending, like, kind of like then a, we cast so you were to pull a Frankenstein <laughs> on yeah. Ferdinand's body, basically. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for letting me talk a little bit about that because like, you know, I was obviously, you know, your players better than I do. And so, mm. you know, their level of comfort. And, <laughs> all right. You know, uh, like <laughs> three quarters of your players better than I do. <laughs> As players. As players. Yes. <laughs> and so like, I think, you know, obviously you'll have that trust built up for you to like do right by them in the story. Um, But I did want to, like, address that for my own personal curiosity. We can cut this if it doesn't fit within the um, tone of the show or anything like that. Um, But it was something I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. Um, But moving on to the next. Speaking of death, tell me, players, how do your characters actually think about death after your experience in Nebulosis? Mm -hmm. Because I feel like being able to go to the afterworld and then coming back, I don't think anyone would blame you for kind of thinking of death as a revolving door. Mm-hmm. Um, and so did that, do you think mm-hmm. that influenced your character's decisions in terms of like coming up with a plan to bring Ferdinand back? Did it make them a little bit more sympathetic to Ferdinand when it came to the ivory masked woman? Like how does that change your view of mortality? 
I think we have a bit of a a bit of a biased sample size as swim because the people that we are encountering on the regular are not average people, right? You know, the people that we've fought and the people who have died and seen come back. You know, we have uncertainty and death with characters like Nesca, for example, or we have us like sort of maybe dying, maybe not dying, coming back, things like that. You know, we hear about this situation of someone escaping death and so I think that there is sort of that sense of seeing death, not necessarily as a revolving door necessarily, but more something that is very uncertain, I think, at least for Mira. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how well that'll bleed over to thinking about regular people because a lot of their interactions now are no longer about regular people. But there is sort of this more... Uh, prescient sense of death not necessarily being final universally, but rather being something where, you know, you're not sure what that means for someone. Mm. Do you think that they're going to face a sort of disconnect with the regular people who they'll be meeting with at Autumn's End? I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking when I said <laughs> that, so I'm glad that you're like, yeah, uh -oh. definitely. And I'm really excited for that. I think with Nebulosis, it definitely showed like Okay, so like even when you died, there was a way out of it in some cases. Like mm. we saw like the different realities. Well, not realities, sorry. Different like fates Pot of ourselves where we have died. Mm. And like at the same time, I think each of us have experienced a near death experience. And I know Serenith has faced like three at this point. So I think <laughs> with her, it's like... <laughs> Death can happen at any point, but <laughs> if you're prepared, I guess, or depending on what ha on how it happens, there's always a way to potentially come back around to where you started kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think being aware that death is around the corner at any time has affected uh, Sarenep's relationships, not only with uh, the rest of you know, y'all study group, but also with people like Philip or with, you know, uh, your family. Do you think those things are related at all? Do you think it is a living life every second to the fullest? Or is it, I am going to be prepared no matter what happens, um, just in case? Hmm. I think this, I think, hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think how, like, obviously, like, throughout this show, after she accidentally like killed someone when they went to like when they went to pattern mm -hmm. everything and then you know almost dying watching who she thought was her cousin almost dying in like well not almost dying that person 100% died in lava <sighs> but like i think like obviously like throughout playing i don't know i think people have picked up on it definitely but like she's definitely a lot more stressed and she's <laughs> even though she under has this weird understanding of like death can always happen but there could be a way to fix it i think at this point she's just sort of angry at the fact that it's going to like it, it could always happen because like her like when she got angry at people at everybody in the loft like every time she turns around something is happening with one of her companions and it could be the time where she can't get back up. Mm. And she's just angry at the fact that she can't seem to have a moment to, like, check herself to make sure that she can be okay for the next time it might happen. And do you think that also plays into her leaving Philip behind? Do you think that now there is a fear to her that, you know, if death is around the corner for the four of you, does it register to her that it could be around the corner for anyone else at Wildcliff? Oh, a hundred percent. Like after after what happened with Philip in the uh, oh my god, I forget the name of it, but when he fell the into the polisherium, the polisherium. Yes, thank you, Luke. Uh, with, thank you, happened, dictionary. Like with yeah, what happened to index. him because like he got like a really bad fever and she didn't know what was happening, and then she ended up spending like days in the infirmary just trying to heal him and she was just freaking out like she has realized how important philip is to her and also how dangerous it is for philip to be a constant presence in her life as for her family i uh, it's not something she wants to think about because she's just been avoiding that until the day where they come out of a portal and she has to face them again. <laughs> uh, ben, Carla, 
How about y'all? How has your experiences affected your character's view of death? And Ben, I'm incredibly interested in your answer considering the Lich book. Yeah. So <laughs> I think with death, Winsler is still pretty naive when it comes to death. Yeah, there's been like a whole revolving door. It's like we've we've done we've they're like people have died, but they've somehow come back in some way. But like death is still death, and I think Winsler is very scared of death, considering that you know Dane died. There's been a lot of like close encounters with it. Like a lot of people close to us have really almost hit the nail in the coffer multiple <laughs> times. So I'm thinking that like. The threat of death is still very real, and although it's not like a definite end, it's a, it's a very difficult hole to get out of. And when you do get out of said hole, you don't come back the same. Mm -hmm. Something's different. Is he trying to avoid going in that hole entirely? I would say probably. It's very death is just very scary to him, and he doesn't want to see like. He doesn't want to see any but any more people like die that would that are close to him and such. So becoming a lich is probably not his first like avenue of choice for that, but it's the more like mm. realistic and like accessible solution to such a thing. Pragmatic. Pragmat yeah. That's the word. Pragmatism. Um, I think for integrity, uh if if the idea of death was in a scale of 1 to 100, I definitely feel like her fear of death is now lower than it was before because, like, okay, I know, I Integrity understands that uh, Ferdinand is powerful and clearly, like, her and Salty together killed a bunch of other witches and are very powerful so she likely yeah, does boss. not have the same amount of power <laughs> as 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 them um but she definitely took notes on how to get out of <laughs> how to get out of hell <laughs> i don't want to go to hell Inte integrity may be a half devil but uh she doesn't want to go to hell um hey, me neither <laughs> <laughs> well she has a she has a magical patron that might save her that's fun that's also awesome. uh, true i wanted to yeah. ask about like do you think her deal with the progenitor might be an avenue for her to escape death itself? Oh, if I could live forever. Yes, please. Yeah, Luke, what, what are you writing down? <laughs> <laughs> I see you writing notes there. Um, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> oh, no, I was just making a joke. Oh. Um, and uh, Luke. Yeah. Now that we have heard all of your players' views on death, uh, what is it like as a DM while running... D&D &D is obviously, uh, or not obviously, D&D &D is a game that um, has combat as one of like one of the core three things that make the game itself. Mm -hmm. An average D&D &D campaign deals a lot in death, and yeah. your campaign is not an average one by any means. Aww. Does it make you hesitate to include uh, these themes of like, hey, yeah, D&D &D at its core is going to be combat, you are going to have to like face enemies with violence mm -hmm. um, and characters will die. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how do you reckon those two things? Like the core of my question is this. Yes. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> um, you? You've touched on a really because, interesting thing. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, yeah. No, I, it's just, you know, it may be because I'm too close, but it breaks my heart for these fucking kids. Dude, you know? what the yeah. fuck? It sucks. Like, <laughs> um, I, this is, I'm, huh. And especially with, like, other player characters and, like, other campaigns shrugging off this kind of thing where it's like, uh -huh. yeah, Ferdinand died. Let me make a joke Whoop. about it. And yeah. then everyone is, like, playing in this campaign. Everyone had a moment where, like, they talked about how, oh, this experience has traumatized me and this is my initial reaction to yes. it. Yes. Does that make um, you hesitate to include these things? Oh, uh, uh, no. God, no. Um, because that's the things that I... I don't know. Those just feel suiting to this. We didn't start this... It, it would be a different story, I think, if we started this and said... Like, if we started with something gentle, like maybe like a fun... Uh, the, the arc's like Whiteout and uh, even Eyes on the Prize, just happy-go-lucky-ish 
arcs. Nothing really horribly bad happens. It's just a lot of like slice of life <laughs> kind of fun stuff. Um, but we started out with going and getting an, uh, this green orb, descending into this ancient uh, ruin, having eating hearts, having visions of murdering people uh, or killing people and hurting people. Um, it's, it's just secrets and uh, uh, sacrifice, I guess. It, and it's like, if that's not clear from the beginning that this shit was going to be on the table, then like, mm. frick, I've done a terrible job at like showing my hand. Um, <laughs> Episode like that, four, no, we eat right. a rotten heart and get visions of everyone around us dying. Go off, go off. <laughs> as soon as, as soon as you were like, yeah, way back at the start, my mind immediately went like, oh, of course, yeah, no, you mm-hmm. ate a black heart. Like it was so gross. One yeah. of the first things that's, that was like described was a giant, like, very tasty, scary snake skeleton. <clears throat> no, uh, yeah, like oh. so. Tell me. Like centering death like that is that a very conscious decision? Are you just wanting to see how these characters deal with that reality having to hit them in the face again and again? I, I think that I sat down when we finished Faint of Heart after I was done riding that high of like having made something that I was happy with. We were <laughs> having made great. something, and I was like, "Oh, I'm, that was really good, y'all." <laughs> um, uh, and then I was y'all like, have "Been on fire for the past few hours." They. Mm, um they kept talking about like yo this shit like everyone was in agony over uh multiple things from faint of heart cribs uh dead Hmm. lizards uh (laughs) uh, that's pretty much it honestly that's it i don't there's not much else that's all you need really to be like upset by it was just a lot of oh an arm that's right sorry (laughs) (laughs) dead I genuinely forgot about that. That wasn't even a wow. joke. Wow. 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 <laughs> that was a big moment and you forgot about it. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Um, but I, coming off of that and thinking about the next ones, I was like, hmm, maybe, maybe there is some merit to talking about what's just happened. Right. And then it, it ill-conceived plans led to the past two arcs, which didn't touch on that stuff. And going forwards, I feel like uh, it's a necessary thing that we're going to have to touch on as a either a, a, a group of students together who have just experienced this thing and are now alone for the first time in a while to process it. Or, I don't know, honestly. That's up to the, the, the players. I'm game for either way. Like, if the, if we just want to go, like, hu- like everything's hunky-dory, ha-ha, jokes, 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 which I don't anticipate whatsoever, um, <laughs> I want that. then that's that's fine with me. But if we want to dig into that uh, a bit, then and get some good juicy drama and, like, uh, feelings and, like, you know, that lovely stuff, then I'm also game for that. I, I'm, I'm game for anything. Anything the artists. players want to do, I'm like, let's do that. Oh, artists. Yeah, like, especially with, I was going to say, if they, like, they have a perfect person to talk about yeah. this thing with, yes, which I is, do. I think their mentor is probably uh, one of the most familiar with death. Not if he's alive. Yeah. Yeah, Luke, where is he? You yeah. haven't told us he yet. He is alive. He's alive, but where is he? Oh, he's very acquainted with death. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, God. Me. I meant, uh, <laughs> I, I meant Yexum, uh, who Oh, my is God. So <laughs> I mean, are no. you kidding me? Obviously, everyone no. has died. He's very Ew. clearly a reanimated skeleton who's just kind oh of gosh. trying to keep everything working in order. I, I really love having a mummy teacher. <laughs> oh, Professor Alaro. Alaro. Damn it! Oh, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I, my favorite thing about Professor Alaro, as a side note, who would be also another character who would be uh, who has extended an open Cause she, cause uh, invitation. Because she can necromance, so Mira has, a, Mira has a plan. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, she would be excellent to speak to about this stuff. Um, uh, you mentioned artists as someone that would be ideal to speak to, and I shrug. I mean, ideal everything. in terms of like being a dramatic uh, foil, yeah. as like I don't know if he would give good advice. Yes, I think he would give very characterful I guess, advice. I think that's the important thing to note is that I don't think of artists at all as a person who's who's capable of dealing with grief in a good way. Or just anything like that, dealing with negative emotions and processing those is uh, not his strong suit, I would say, uh, based <laughs> on a couple of pieces suit? of evidence. His strong suit is not getting that much done in uh, like 300 years. Shit. Being really tired. 
I love conversations in catapults because we get to shit on one of the most beloved characters <laughs> in all of TNT. Listen, I, I listen. love Artis. Artis is my favorite NPC. I've said this repeatedly. I will mock that man relentlessly. Yeah. Yeah. Artis does always. great at being just a really, really tired mentor father. He's good figure. at being yeah. tired. Yeah. I mean, he got a crib done. He, do we he even know he made the crib? Just not used. I, <laughs> I put on some Johnny Cash. I put on some Johnny Cash. Probably like the same three songs, make myself a little bit sad, and then go talk, like go write six post it notes about artists, and then cry myself to sleep. And then that's the next like year of trials and trebs, you know? That is the artist's method. Uh, hey, only here you can get this behind the scenes look at uh, <laughs> prepping. Can he even do that if it doesn't have a roof? Dang. Artist? He does. He fixed. Anyways. Oh, okay. This is a. This is a conversation should happen. In, yes. In <laughs> Jeez Louise. Now, I, I want to pivot here. Um, pivot? Pivot! To, <laughs> yes. Uh, because this arc was about Ferdinand. Oh, yeah. Like, it is, it's so interesting. And I want to, like, give you props for this, which is, it felt almost as if, like, we were coming in at the end of someone else's story. Mm -hmm. um, like, this was putting on the last season of like Breaking Bad or a similar prestige show where it's like all about a character's bad decisions catching up oh, to them. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Exactly. It is, you know, and the player characters had a very deciding role in that. And I have a yeah. question for the players, which is we only were able to see this final chapter in Ferdinand's life when she is no longer has any resources that she can really pull to get out of trouble that she's used in the past. She's getting outsmarted by a bunch of kids, and then she dies. Tell me, did the lack of context, everything that you know about Ferdinand has been from other people's mouths, with a few exceptions, which even then I don't know how much we can trust Ferdinand. Did the lack of context, how did that influence your decisions when dealing with Ferdinand? Did that make you more or less sympathetic to her? Here's my two cents on that. So... I think with Ferdinand, the short time that we've had with her, a lot of the stuff that we've been told was that she is a horrible person. She's conniving. She's manipulative. She'll do anything to sort of like basically like use you for whatever and then basically toss you away and be sayonara. Um, <laughs> so that's the gist of like what we got as of her personality before we even met her. And then when we met her, you know, she was putting on the charm and stuff quite literally. Um, and she was still, <laughs> she was still being like very manipulative. So part of what they said was pretty much true. So without any sort of like further sort of information about exactly what she did and who she is as a person, didn't really make it feel like I was on her side to begin with. And I feel like maybe if we took the time to maybe learn more about Ferdinand and like have more like one-on-one -on -one talks with her like heart to heart instead of her you know being classic like i am supermodel egotistical look at me pose <laughs> like <laughs> i feel like that might have changed things even if you had a one-on-one -on -one, there like i may be bringing too much of myself into this but in that situation how do you know if she is telling you the truth at that point i don't know i definitely feel for feel for ferdinand so like I was very saddened about her death because somehow I feel like we've bonded, even though she clearly manipulated me into seeking higher power and stealing magic from the god. <laughs> um, uh -huh. um, so she very clearly manipulated me. But thinking about like, that's me, Carla, and like the audience seeing that. But for integrity, I, at that point, I certainly don't think that she would have realized that. And she feels sort of like there's a bond there. And the fact that they have to make the decision on whether someone will die or not. Like, this is like a direct, like, yeah, you go ahead, go die right now. Um, mm -hmm. I think that despite not knowing a lot about her past integrity feels in a at least like a little bit close to her like maybe 20 percent mm. um, <laughs> out of 100 
but still that there's that 20 percent even though there's like this entire life of hers that integrity didn't know her but mm-hmm. that specific moment because i i guess like in some ways she is sentimental where it's like oh remember that time when you were tied to each other and um, <laughs> i had you on my back like <laughs> good times <laughs> Um, shared trauma brings people closer together yeah. so yeah even though um i don't know a lot about her past i think that i took a liking to her a little bit like mm. a tiny bit very um, little please don't hate me all <laughs> a grain of we sand don't hate you first man for all her faults was an incredibly charismatic individual mm. which is what i want to be so i don't <laughs> <laughs> integrity meets her role model <laughs> get myself out of hell I. Again, like I said, before, like at the very beginning, like in one word, Sarah Neff's feelings towards this whole thing was complicated. I think she's spent her whole life around the socialites and the two-faced nobles that she's pretty okay with picking up on this isn't 100% genuine, as we have seen in previous parts where I have made a joke of like, oh yeah, this is a cult, and then, oh, it's actually a okay cool thanks i was right cool um but like um she like just the whole journey and the fact that like the first thing that fernand did was charm mira to try and get us get herself out of that situation talked us into completely derailing an original plan for the promise of safety for the group which we ended up going with anyway because it was like the best option at that moment um i think one of the big things though that made sarah Neff completely turn the other way was the fact that in the i would i think it's like a, i think it was a day in total of us traveling with her mm-hmm. around that in that whole yeah. day of like this doesn't feel right meeting semi for like a, a couple of minutes was like okay this person is safe this person cares. They want to help us. And so Sarah Nepp had her whole moment with her, with Semelai on the branch. And yes. like it was, she felt very genuinely like, okay, this person is good. And then whatever the heck Ferdinand did ended up hurting Semelai was the moment of, okay, this good person has now been hurt because of this other person's selfishness. I have to protect that. And she kind of went off on her then and then... Mm-hmm. Hearing all the extra stories of like why everyone was going after Ferdinand versus Ferdinand saying why she was innocent and Sarah Nepp still being like, there is not, it's not a hundred percent here and I don't trust this. Like all in all, it was just, I don't like this, but I've seen this type of person before. So there's familiarity to it. Mm. Not like a like of familiarity, but it's. But it's a familiar something. feeling of contempt. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Just complicated. Like, <laughs> didn't like her, didn't dislike her. Well, okay, kind of disliked her. Uh, I think that's <laughs> really kind of disliked, disliked her. Kind of disliked her. I want to ask why not, because uh, <laughs> if, if everyone came out of this arc liking Ferdinand, I would have felt like other than the audience. <laughs> and even in the audience, not everyone likes her, which is awesome. Oh, yeah. Good, I love oh, that. Shout out to Oceanic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if everyone, if all the players came out of this arc being like, Ferdinand, she's the bomb.com. Absolutely I nice. would have been like... Yeah, when creating Ferdinand, was she meant to be irredeemable or was she ally. just meant to be shady? Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. That's, oh, okay, okay, okay. Was she supposed to be irredeemable? I and don't. And if you would like, that... you can think about that because we still haven't heard from Sarah. Um, mm, good point. Yes. And Sarah, if you do not wish to answer the question, you do not. No, it's have good. To. Like, how like general or specific are we? Are we sort of kind of on everything? Go so good. specific. Yeah. Hmm. Just sort of in terms of Mira. Yeah. I mean. Hmm. I'm in love with her. I mean, yeah, <laughs> obviously, like, it's it's very difficult for Mira to sort of suss out her whole feeling on everything to do with Ferdinand just because, like, she immediately gets charmed as soon as she meets Ferdinand. And obviously, she's ob- you know, very pissed about that throughout the entirety of the arc. You see her being, like, quite <laughs> hostile to Ferdinand. But at the same time, like, sort of trying to advocate for her not to stay permanently dead. And I think that all of Mira's feelings about Ferdinand in terms of, you know, whether it's, like, wanting to bring her back or wanting 
to have her not die. And some of that is just the the sort of her, her Ferdinand sort of like stealing Mira's form for a second and that sort of being a weird thing. But I think a lot of it isn't about Ferdinand as a specific person, but more so about the general principle of like, I don't want to let a person die if I have the option not to, or mm-hmm. I don't want to break a promise to someone, especially something this severe. And so I think that while she f- sees Ferdinand as like fundamentally a, a pretty bad person and someone that she has a lot of personal gripe with, I think for Mira, it's more about like the general principle of what this means to Mira and what it would mean if it were anyone in Ferdinand's position, if that makes sense. Mm, I gotcha. So it's really, a you know, your choice to continue down the path of trying to figure out a way to resurrect Ferdinand is not necessarily a choice that you make on behalf of Ferdinand, no. but one that you make on behalf of Mira. Exactly. Interesting. Yes. Okay. I like that. Hmm. Now, Luke, back to the Hi. question. Uh, Ferdinand, you're redeemable or shady. You decide. Oh, I envisioned her. I think the quote, I, I can actually just read the quote because I took a picture of it the other day um, for the sake of sharing. I'll read to you one of my post notes. It's definitely not the original post note because Ferdinand, as a character, I created the same night that I woke up from a, like a fever dream and wrote down all of my notes on the old chapel and the myriad plot hooks that have not yet been uncovered there as well as just I, I like drew a map wrote down a thousand plot hooks and then wrote the name Ferdinand and then I wrote rival witch um <laughs> and then over the time to- over time I developed that but recently I think around the end of faint of heart I started contemplating you know what's coming next and I was like oh we're probably gonna do the Ferdinand shit coming up right like likely um so a, a-, a lovely note is that I have, which I think indicates my uh, perspective on who she is. Ferdinand is a scheming, good-for-nothing coward and liar. She loves beautiful people and beautiful things and betrays on an opportunistic whim. Um, So is she irredeemable or not? I don't think that I'm the one to answer that question. I don't... That would be an interesting thing to talk about and explore um, because I just think redemption and whether or not characters are redeemable is a very interesting concept um like at what point does she think she should be you know yeah does she think Um, that she should have to be redeemed yeah is is ferdinand genuinely apologetic for the things she's done or she's done does she think the things she's done are bad things i think the answer to that second part would be yes she thinks that that she's done bad things etc she says uh i don't take people's skins without permission etc right Mm. um like Liar. she she listed well this is the thing she listed the time that she got out of hell as one of those times that she just had no other choice right like this was the only opportunity she had to take it right the same way when pushed into a corner um her emergency exit was taken when Serenep took that bag of Isithil's divinity and put it back in the sea and etc um she'd been cornered i was almost thinking of her as like definitely like a cornered animal right of like what how do i get out of here definitely stopped viewing people as potential allies and more so just like how do i use these people around me as a means to get out of here alive right and that was really fun and that's why she's like super quiet for during that entire like discussion is just like contemplating is do i do this do i do that do i do this and then she's like integrity untie me untie me right now right um because she has a plan and things like or it's not that she had a fully concrete plan she just needed to do something right because she wasn't just going to sit there and and die um which is where things were headed and where things ended up uh i don't know i definitely wanted her to be shady as hell uh like through and through like selty is shady as hell and she's like a lovely old grandma and came across as like this i never intended selty to be such a menace as she is, or, or she's perceived as such a menace, right? Selty, in reality, has done very little harm, right? The net positive of Selty greatly outweighs the slight, sh- the slight like murkiness of her morality, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> maybe she the didn't players charm people as soon as she met them. Exactly. Like, she just uses her natural charm. Exactly. If she stops um, trying to steal my to fingernails, I'll be okay with her. <laughs> She wasn't. Mm. She asked you for them. She wasn't stealing them. I don't want her to um, take my fingernails. <laughs> Meanwhile, well, just say no. I bet. I bet if Salty was in the boat with us while everyone's sleeping, she'll be like clipping our uh, like. Fingernails. 
<laughs> and be like, oh, I'm Sarah just giving you a manicure. You know, I haven't clipped my nails in four months, and yet they still look great. What the deal? Seraph has never uh, clipped her nails before. Yeah. Oh, I just happens. got this from um from Earth, and it's called gel nail polish. Do you want one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do it love glows in the dark. I do love Celtic, and I'm glad we got to meet Ferdinand because I feel like, at least from my point of view, since I came up with her so long ago, I feel like she's been like breadcrumbed throughout a lot of different things right like there were a lot of um things pointing towards ferdinand maybe that's not true um maybe it is who knows it feels that way to me but i feel that way a lot about a lot of things understandable also you know off the top of my head this is a blooper um hey what is that position that's open for like the potentiality thing is there oh is the that shepherd of still potentiality open? yeah oh 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 Give that to ferdinand. my god the extra conversations of, hey, what if we had Ferdinand? I'm like, I will, no, stop right now. Never. I mean, one of my no. one of my original plans was maybe seeing if she would want it. No. But all, hey, <laughs> well, first you wanted to see if she's crappy or not. Yeah. And we know yeah. that. There was a conversation <laughs> on the way to, to, to the marsh where all of you were walking through the woods and going, well, if she's not a bad person, we do X, mm-hmm. Y, Z. If she, <laughs> but, but if she's but. a bad person... <laughs> And then, mind you, that things, was also before yeah. we met Loud, and it became a very real like, if you don't do this, I'm gonna kill ya. And it was like, oh, let's well. just yep. make Loud the okay. immortal one. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know how many times I have to I, do this to you guys this. every time you make these kinds of suggestions. Then he owes no. you. Loud, Loud will never be replaced because anyone who tries to kill him will be killed first. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. But he yeah. can. That's probably and, uh, true. <laughs> I had yeah, I had prepared scenarios um based on that information. Um and mm. the, the the proposed jokes that just transpired. I had let them ruminate, uh aerate in my brain for a little bit, and that would have been a fun way to go. I think any way that this arc ended would have been fun, unless it just ended in a lame way, which is you know, like they just go, We're all friends now, right? Yay. Like that would have been like nope. yeah. But also with this group, with you DMing, that was never going to happen. So I think that <laughs> the building blocks in place. That's how we solved pets. Oh, the sad yeah. things. Oh. Yeah, that's how pets was solved. Yeah. This is, but this isn't. Allow pets. me to rephrase. You wouldn't do that a second time. Yeah, that's uh, fair. it's done. Virgil's now. too yeah. cute yeah. to have enemies. I've never done anything twice. <laughs> <laughs> I had a shingle. Uh, it's a good right? K-pop group. Uh, Luke, nice. I had another question. Like yeah. speaking of loud. And this also, I want to talk to the players about, in the same vein, all three of the people who were after Ferdinand were extraplanar entities. Mm. Tell me, like, how did their alien nature kind of factor in to their dealings with the students? Ooh. Um, and students did, like, and this is specifically, like, uh, Sarah, you are the one who is very much spearheading the negotiations. <laughs> I like, help, Did I'm you sorry. take those things in, like, was that in uh, consideration or was it just like, all right, now I've seen the per- people's personalities, you know? Well, there was definitely the weirdness of, like, Mira not fully understanding how slad norms work, but it seems to be, you know, you eat something more powerful than you and you become powerful. It is very much an alien thing, and so sort of trying to negotiate with it is very much like <laughs> talking about things that would no reasonable person would ever be saying. And I do think that Mira was very awkwardly trying to navigate that, especially with Loud, where it's like, well, you can eat this snake, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved, loved, loved Mira throwing so many things at the wall in terms of being like, does this appeal to you, Loud? Does this? <laughs> and then Loud at the end of just saying, yes, all of those things appeal to me. I would like them all. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. Fucking dude. But Luke, how did that like play into how you play these characters? Like, do you consider like in the monster manual, Slotty mm-hmm. are considered like the epitome of chaos? Yes. Did that come in? Like, because Loud doesn't seem like someone who is no what we would think of as like wild, chaotic. Uh, mm-hmm. He just is very. He's a slad going his own way. Evil. You know, uh, Nathan. I. That's a very mm-hmm. excellent way to put it. He that Loud is a slad that's gone his own way. Um, he's not on his home plane, the plane of Stivus, uh, where the other slads live. Sladdy live. Um. he's this almost i think of him strongly as like 
a very angry and petty person, right? And I don't know, those are human or like that's personification of this being of innate chaos who is just a toad uh, who eats other toad monsters to grow more powerful. <laughs> but like, I-, I think that him being just an angry, petty dude who chases people across the plains for revenge uh, in combination with Selty who travels the plains and like collects things for her shop in conjunction with Ferdinand who is just on the fucking run constantly from everything all at once and her single goal is I just want to make my own plane where I will be safe because I get to choose who gets in and gets out and then we have the ivory masked woman who is the is the like extension of the deity in charge of hell and so like these people are all very very like used to traveling across the multiverse right and do so for myriad reasons and have a good time doing it or presumably have a good time doing it and i think that there was a couple interactions where um even loud was like y'all should get out and see the wider multiverse sometime um (sighs) Uh, yeah, I, I think that that was partially me extent. That was me on one hand, these people do explore the, the, the different planes, so they would treat swim the same, right? Because swim are from a different, uh, plane of existence. And so they would be like, oh, you're just other extra planar entities, right? So you're pretty much the same as us. So from my perspective, all those characters were essentially just treating Swim as if they were just regular. Like this is just the way of our lives is we all deal with people who are not from or are kind of alien to us, right? And and, um, also kind of on a more meta sense, extending the branch of if this is something you all want to do, then let's do that. Because there was that, there, there was a potential for Ferdinand stealing skins, Ferdinand going to the loft, which was her intention, and getting some magic, which was her intention, and then just getting the fuck out of there, right? And then we have this, do we, do, I, I, in my thought, I was like, there would, there might be this snag of if one of the players or the students had had their skin be stolen, would they just chase after Ferdinand then? That would have been cool, right? Like, is that what happens next? Or do they just go back to school as a frog, right? <laughs> <laughs> Delness. Oh my god. I went gosh. on a field trip and a lot of things change. <laughs> oh, Jokes cool. on you. Delis is into it. I did oh, not Robin. sign up for this. I actually had like an interesting question slash scenario yeah. in regards oh. to that. So you know how the ivory masked woman turned to wood? Yes. After like the whole uh, after uh, she did a violence. Enacting violence upon somebody. I mm. wonder if Loud Sword hit. That would mean they would yes. turn to wood, but would Correct. that mean that they would stay in Serenep's skin as wood? And would that mean Serenep would be stuck as yes. loud? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what that meant. That would have been I really know, creepy and horrifying. Serenep's status already, which means she could never go into the library again in fear of breaking <laughs> whatever fourth wall they have in there. Well, yeah, that would that would have been really creepy that Serenep would not what have would been have, able to get her skin back. What would have been Serenep's parents' reaction? Hopefully Ava's okay wherever she is, because she's still there, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Um, we just say that Sarah got lost in the plane of Isithil. <laughs> Let them deal with whatever legal stuff they want to do. And I would probably have stayed there with Semolai once they came out to be like, is there a way to undo this so I can get my skin back? <laughs> Yikes. This there was Serenov's plan all along to get out of her like parents' skin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if that was something that I was like very aware of which is genuinely why i missed it when it happened to the ivory masked woman is that i was so prepared for our that's the thing that you touched on nathan which is like the loud seems like not an element of chaos except for in this specific scenario because he's a very calm you're not calm he's a very like uh he's direct, focused? direct you know and what's like up. focused on what he wants like he's like i am going to take care of this goal and when ferdinand is dead then i will kill all of you he wasn't just like i'm gonna kill all of you immediately right now ah let's go he was like no this th- there's an order to these things etc but he's a confounding element i guess in the 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 moral puzzle of what what do we do with ferdinand because if with him out of the picture it would have been a lot easier i think 
Um, maybe that's just my perspective, but because he was like, I want to kill her. I want to do it. I want to do it. Right. Uh, and she has to stay dead, etc. It was just a confounding element. So the two people Absolutely. attacking, if the ivory masked woman and loud turned to wood, it would have been like, ah, what an easy situation now. Um, let's go to, I have, uh, two more questions. One of which is just for the players. The other one is for the whole table. First one. Having a satisfying ending to an arc seems like it is a difficult goal to achieve, um, especially one like this that has lasted over like a quarter of a year. So tell me, like, what goes through everyone's minds when you head into what you assume is going to be the final episode? Or did you like not have any idea that this could have been it? I usually don't like to think about that. Usually, <laughs> usually if it's just... If it's just a train that's going, it's going. I don't know where it's going to end, but it's just going to keep going. <laughs> that is the most Ben answer. I, I love you. Yeah. It's just, it's just going to keep on going. <laughs> When's it going to end? We'll find out when we get there. Do you think about this thing? No. <laughs> um, do I think about the consequences of my actions? No. <laughs> <laughs> we don't reach that point. We're never going to reach that point. <laughs> um, it's just a game. Exactly. It's fine. Um, I think... I know we said it earlier during this as like, well, not as like a, a joke, haha joke, but like as a, oh man, we're, we're doing this. But like these mm. poor kids mm. <laughs> who are just sort of surviving with this. And I think it's really hard at the end of an arc at this point, I think to have a really satisfying ending ending where everything can get wrapped up because there's been so many interconnected like things like things that happened in past arcs have affected things in this arc and how we react to things. And I feel like it would be hard at this point to really nicely wrap up an arc and then move on to a more light hearted thing we hope is going to be a light hearted thing. I can see you slightly smirking there in the corner, Luke. <laughs> um, <laughs> we hope. But like, I think I think my constant joke has been group therapy appointments, please. But like, mm -hmm. when I look, when I think about like, how would like, for instance, my character have a nice, like, how would this wrap up nicely for Serenep? And I just kind of end up thinking about like, how, like our whole conversation with death earlier, like, she hasn't really talked to anyone about the fact that she, like, murdered someone in the first place, and now she's helped in the murder with a second person, and it's, like, again, like, the things before linking into things in this arc. I feel like, though the problems in the arc have been settled, the overlapping of, like, mental health has still has a ways to go mm. before anything like that could be wrapped up nicely. Hmm. I see. I'm interested to see how that goes, especially in, you know, this does appear like, I don't know if you break down trials and trebuchets to say it is a show about a magical school, but when you break it down to be like about its themes, uh, it appears that one that has emerged through play is dealing with the trauma of adventuring. Um, so I am excited to see that play out as time goes on. And I think that you have done a very good job of like playing that up through Sarah Nub. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Carla, Sarah, Luke, do y'all have any like, you know, thoughts going into the end of an arc or is it just head empty? <laughs> um, I think just by virtue of, my job and who I am as a person when I'm evaluating the creation <laughs> of any content that Crazy. I am making, it very much happens as it's created. Like when I work on anything, it's very much a simultaneous process of making it and also evaluating like how an outside person will see it. Mm. Like as I'm saying anything, it's like, how is an audience going to perceive whatever is happening right now? So when I go into like any episode when I'm playing, but especially somewhere where like a story gets wrapped up and we need an interesting culmination, I'm very mm. much simultaneously thinking about like what's going to be interesting to listen to um i mean and fun to play like for example um like during whiteout when we were all like okay we're gonna leave like i was internally screaming because it's me as sarah sitting there thinking about how this is going to be very uninteresting mm -hmm. to listen to but i'm also thinking about staying in character as mira and how that needs yeah. to be entertaining and how i can't like metagame and do this thing just because plot and so yeah. it's very much like a dual thought of me when i go into anything of like how do i 
you know, as Sarah, like thinking about it from like an analytical story perspective, make choices that are interesting while still thinking like from a Mira perspective of like reacting as Mira and making choices that are consistent with my character. So it's very much like I'm, I'm being in the moment. I'm thinking about the story on a meta level. And then I'm thinking about like Mira on a character level. <laughs> if oh that makes sense. Gosh. It's like producer Sarah and actor Sarah have to be the yes. same Sarah. They cannot be separate right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That is exactly yeah. like the right. two Spider-Mans pointing at each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I um for me, I think that um if Sarah is an actor and a producer, I think I focus way too much on the actor part. Like I I sometimes I often fail to like look uh look outside of the scenario and I'm really into the heat of the moment. And sometimes what's problematic with that for me is that my my brain sometimes is not like working so fast like i'm too relaxed like for example um in the end there when luke asked us if we had like any final messages for ferdinand and in my head i'm like i want i want something like really good because i was feeling that like pain about what's about to happen um so i wanted it to be uh like uh there's a word for it um, significant. I wanted to be mm. a significant goodbye message, but since I was too into the game, but not um thinking fast enough, I failed to like get that product that I want, that I thought would be like very good for a listener as well. Um, so I think I am working towards like being able to also realize that this is not just uh this is this is more than just um being in the moment but there's also like a production quality that um has to come with it i guess so it's so interesting you say that because the very end i thought you really nailed the complicated relationship mm -hmm. that integrity had with for yeah. yeah, so like I, it makes it almost makes me sad to feel to hear you say that you didn't feel like you did like a good job for like an audience there because I thought you knocked it out of the park. And, oh, like, please hire me know. then. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> the switch. Matt Mercer, get at us. <laughs> Netflix, uh, call Luke. me. <laughs> yeah. Luke, out of anyone here, you would probably have the best idea of whether or not you're about to hit the end. Huh. Really? You about to kill somebody? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I have no idea. I think I told them six weeks, six episode recordings in a row. This is the last one, y'all. Like from like episode one twelve on, I was like, "This is it. This is it, y'all. We're in." I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Don't believe you. So, the end of the arc at the yeah. end of an episode. <laughs> so I was like, "The boy who cried wolf." By the end of it, like I'm sure I said, "Okay, this is the finale of it," and they were like probably not dumbass right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> i kind of realized um, once we oh sorry no go speak interrupt me i i i'm genuine <laughs> i was just gonna say like i think yeah you you saying like i was kind of like the boy who cried wolf at the end i think i realized once we were like when it went loud like le leaped across the table that i was like oh uh -huh. yeah wait this is actually the end of it okay this is the end end <laughs> and then yeah. you were like and we're gonna wait till next time I'm like, okay so next episode is gonna be like the last episode for this okay cool yeah um mm -hmm. i don't have a good idea of when things are gonna end i'm terrible at it i think pacing above everything else is my the area that needs the most work mood i would hey, say right there with you <laughs> i would DMs. say it's hard you cannot pace a, yeah. a story that you are writing uh, week to week with like six days between writing mm -hmm. like that is you can it is an incredibly difficult yeah, thing i'm not good at it <laughs> me neither <laughs> um i've that, never met a dm who is the, you know? the the times that arcs end when i think is good for them to end is uh, minimal um I have predetermined ideas of like these would be good stopping points for arcs, etc. For 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 this one specifically, I was like, oh, I could end here, it could end there, it could go this way, it could go that way, right? There was so many different moving pieces that it was hard for me to conceptualize. You can see, you can hear this the the steam coming out of my ears in the last episode <laughs> when I asked the players to roll damage and like offload some of that mental 
labor onto them as I was just sitting here looking at my notebook full of things and processing everything and being like, what? How do we pull this in for a landing? I'm Endings terrify me, quite honestly. Uh, and the longer that the podcast as a whole goes on, I feel like the scarier that gets. But anytime we end an arc good, right? Like this one I feel is a bitter, like you come away from it bitter. One of the best endings to an arc I think mm-hmm. TNT has had. Okay. Yes. Like bar none. Yeah. To me, it is yeah. easily one of my favorite endings. Um. So anytime we get like a good ending on an arc, I that kind of like confidence is bolstered. It's, it's so... I don't know when arcs are going to end. I try to make them just satisfying in as many ways as possible. I'm trash at tying up loose ends, though. I'm, But that's an important thing. No, that is a very important thing, though, because I'm not a good writer. So I need to leave as many hooks dangling for myself as possible so that Mm -hmm. in the future when I'm struggling, I can just look back on what I've left for myself. So Mm, it's a simultaneous little... uh, It's a safety deposit. yeah, it's a, it's a what, do you think, security. what do you think the first half of this arc was? That first half was me setting myself up for like every single arc ever, right? Every <laughs> single thing. I think every single scene for the first half of this arc set up a plot that I want to do something with. I think almost every single one. I love that. Tell us um, what it is. Oh, no. <laughs> if you um, slow down the audio, you can actually hear how <laughs> the entire Wild Cliff yeah. saga will end. <laughs> if you play episode one's Nine Towers monologue backwards, you actually hear the finale of it. Also, yeah. You it hear like, the Beatles musically. start playing, and we don't know how that happened, but like you can That's hear it. That's just because of episode one audio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was just someone driving by in the background with their radio on real loud. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, well, yeah. Another thing that everyone else touched on, which is like that producer versus player kind of mentality, because I'm a player here also, uh, y'all. You are. Um, and you just I, play a lot of different characters. Yeah, and I have a great time every time, um, <laughs> most times. Um, <laughs> and for me, there's a lot going on because I have to be technically monitoring everything because I'm the editor also. I have to be... And so, like, making sure that if there's a tech problem that it gets addressed or other such things, I have to also be, like, processing and keeping all the rules which we don't use in the back of my head. I have to have, like, um, that producer mentality of, like, this is the things that are happening, but also, like, the a large amount of flexibility because what I've written is just a draft and the players have the final say in how that changes and nothing is canon until I just sputter it out in a in a in a ranty like style when I don't stop talking at them um and so there's a lot going on and absolutely uh recently I've tried to focus a lot more on not how it's going to sound and if something's going to be cool to listen to but more so if it's just going to be fun for the players and I'm very like that's my then my primary worry for like the for the last like quarter of the episodes. year well no it drifted <laughs> away for a little bit honestly um of like oh I want to make something that is n- the most interesting to listen to etc yeah you want to make a good show yeah. instead of playing a good game yes and so there's this balance which needs to be struck between there's a reconciliation which must happen um between those two things and so I just want my uh players to have a fun time and, and we do. I think you've done. I I'm think, sorry. from what I hear from the players, they have a good time. Yes. So. Oh, yeah. I hear different uh, things. Trauma aside, audio. it's very fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said before, trauma gives us content. Yeah. Uh, all right. Suffering. Final question. And this is a big one. This might be the only time that I'm able to ask this question in the whole of Conversations and Catapults, oh. which is well, damn. what did y'all get when you leveled up? Oh. Uh, <laughs> <ooh. laughs> I'm gonna walk away from this because I don't want to know. I hate actually knowing. I mean, I already players. told you what I did. So. I already told. I already put yeah, that same. in thing too. So like, what the? Okay, bye. Weird. <laughs> I just don't want to hear it right now because I'm in like a plotting kind of mood, and I don't oh, usually like plotting. plotting. I don't. I don't like knowing what tools the players have uh, in their toolkits. I just like making problems. Well, and like getting <laughs> also getting surprised um, and trying to piece together what they're going to do. Uh, that's the fun of it for me. So I don't like knowing what they have really. Like I said, like I, I already told you, Luke, what it is mm-hmm. and the reasoning behind what it is, kind of thing. So, my 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 thought was just yeah, just a lot of things that you get when you level up have to do with combat, and combat is a rare thing. So it feels good to be able to share 
I I also agree with you because then we can also get a reasoning why everyone chose the thing they chose. Exactly. Hmm. But it really depends on whether y'all want to share it with the wider audience or not. I'm fine sharing it because it's not a combat thing. So we're not going to have to wait a while for it to come up. Um, <laughs> it is, I took the spell Locate Creature where you can find a person within, I think it was a thousand feet. And I think that that basically spans the whole campus. And I feel like mm. that's then probably going to be useful. Really would have been helpful during uh, <laughs> during Moonrathon. <laughs> and I hope that it comes in handy another time. Where's dullness? <laughs> I need yeah. to find my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's that's exclusively what the spell is going because to there's for. no yeah. cell you call phones, girlfriend detector so like, <laughs> dullness that's is true. sometimes notoriously difficult to track down so i feel like yeah. that's reasonable mm-hmm. well definitely we will definitely not have to worry about artists anymore <laughs> Uh, <laughs> stop i don't want to well, we already don't have dead. to worry about it anymore. so here's no, the thing what if artists <laughs> Wow, Ben, you just uh, Luca just, just possessed you for a second. Just, yeah. yeah, I yeah. I I kidnapped his bit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, listen. On this podcast, we love it. Uh, we love talking about artists biting it. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, because we love him so much. <laughs> Biting into a we big spoonful so of we'll... oatmeal. Yeah. Right? No, he's yeah. no dying. So funny. Oh, he's he's, he's dying. dying. That's that's yeah. that's, that's, that's you guys yeah. want yeah. artists to die? Uh, no, no, but yeah. No, but we doesn't mean we want to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I got two new magic powers, and uh, <laughs> what about integrity? Though, what did she get? Hell yeah! <laughs> Carla can now levitate. Listen, and if Carla just messaged us one day and said, "I have magic powers," I'd be like, "Yeah, that's Carla." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and like part of the decision making was like with some help from Ben. Because like mm-hmm. I, I I was like because I was like talking to Luke about it and it was like Ben is like the right resource because Ben has played warlocks before and so basically so I it, I leveled up my warlock is what Fuck happened yeah. yeah um we fucking love to see it and love the thing is I don't have a lot of spell slots so I was like okay I need to find something that because the what's the word for it incantation Invo- invocation invocation <laughs> um does not need spell slots so i'm like well i don't want to be useless when in combat so i chose one that is like combat specific that wouldn't um uh use a uh use a spell slot, spell slot. and the other one is to make myself more useful because sometimes i am useless uh <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, no, no. So I'm sorry you feel that um, way. I those don't think that's true. Two things that I chose. Um, I'm not gonna be super specific, actually, except for the fir- except for the one that will make me less Are- useless, and it's so that I can understand a lot of things. What's it called, oh, though? <laughs> um, the Eye cool. of the Rune Stone. <laughs> eyes of the Rune Keeper. I don't it? think that's the. It's uh, It's yeah. Eyes of the Rune Keeper. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Integrity can name it whatever she wants. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> true. Bat snake laser vision. Bat snake <laughs> vision. <laughs> Anyone else want Jeez. to guess? I'll leave it as an option rather than a question to be a- answered as like, here's exactly what I've got. I will leave it for now. Ooh. That's I awesome. feel like one of those things will come up eventually. Pretty soon. <laughs> as, I think I've already said it five times. I'm not going to say it again. Um, but um, my, what I ended up choosing was ice storm because i thought it would be narratively interesting because we were in the loft and there was like the raging Mm -hmm. snowstorm happening Mm -hmm. outside and this whole can and this whole arc had like Mm -hmm. a huge impact on her that like this like she has in like plus the whole discussion about like you had like oh you have like a lot of like elemental like stuff in your blood and like so i thought like an i like the ice storm spell would like add to Mm -hmm. that narrative yes elsa You're becoming more and more Elsa. See, I can I, gotcha. I can feel I like myself that. plotting. I can literally feel myself plotting as I'm you're so speaking. Sorry, Luke. No, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am going to plot your downfall. Thank you, Sam, for giving me all this information. Oh, you to can you can make your character. a snowstorm. Let me bring you to the desert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, also, I think <laughs> relating back to like the we probably won't see it because if if they're combat things in a while. Autumn's end is coming up, you know. It's, yes. Oh, true. It's here. Let's Hell go. Yeah. You know. Hey, it's been coming up for I the past five. Can't months. wait to fight for people <laughs> in his yeah. lightning magic. Okay. But the next well. arc's gonna be Autumn's end, right? Yeah. Right. Next it's arc gonna be Autumn's yeah. end. Yeah. The next arc's Autumn's end. 
Right. Okay. Wait. Like, no next chance. arc is out of like, Okay. It's, yeah, yeah. Next arc is out of Zen. Okay. I'm so high. You also said that all right. I probably Hell can't yeah. use warlock powers, right? Because they'll be like, you're a fucking I, warlock. Listen, that's a Carla information. That's not a you're integrity a what information. Now? Don't meta game. Figure out what that spells are in other classes and then go from there. Like, yeah, I'm multi class. <laughs> as this other a majority thing. of the time, warlocks are just kind of like, hey, this is my spell now. Mm. It's true. Well, everyone, thank you all so much for joining me. Um, it was great. You know, Woo! it was. Whee! And hey, this is an odd numbered episode, which means that it's someone else's turn to go ahead and do the sign off. It's rare that we have a chance for everyone here. Uh, who wants to do the. Usual sign off we all know and love from conversations and catapults. <laughs> pew, Wait, pew, is it my pew, turn? Pew. Is that it? Luke, you're giving me a look like it's my turn. No, it's my <laughs> turn. It. I just don't know. I don't know the sign off, but I know the outro. <laughs> Do the outro. I'm pretty sure that's the same thing. No, because Nathan says yeah, a funny thing whenever we record, oh, and there's like okay. 17 right. takes. <laughs> I don't I don't know what y'all do. Um, thank you everyone for you listening listen. to this episode. It was a joy. It was really weird to record with everyone here because more normally it feels like a one-on-one conversation. Uh, I feel very much more on, on the stand as it were for my thoughts as a DM. Um, but if you enjoyed this episode, uh, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That's one of the biggest ways that you could show support for us. That's three. Other than just telling people you know or people online that the, the, you like the show and they should listen to it uh, additionally if you want to see teasers or art uh, or send us art and let me, let us see it and other such things or post funny things on the internet and get it retweeted uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Trials and Trebs also in the episode description if you're into talking to other people who like this show or at the very least listen to it uh, there is a link to join our discord uh, which is a good old fun time lots of people there there's listening parties there's tons of wonderful art and uh, visually and uh, written uh, just a good old time and there's discussions mostly not about the podcast as well um, and the final uh, little plug is for our patreon if you enjoyed this as i've said many times uh and you have the means to do so supporting us on patreon uh lets us pay for things uh pay for uh back-end things as well as uh pay the people who make this show uh and uh essentially buy groceries and pay off bills and things like that at, at least a very small amount but the more people do donate to us the the bigger that allows us to expand we have fun uh goals on there that are relatively new uh and there's a bunch of interesting uh tiers that might pique your interest uh and i think that's it nathan there's well, also a lot of interesting so tiers much. on the podcast because because we cry i was them. thinking that S- Sarah. Well, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Thank you all for joining me at this uh, funeral for a frenemy. And now, you know, let's go ahead and uh, hear Ferdinand's last words one more time. I think it was something like. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And that's it for us. Thank you all so much. We're out. Ah, this is so sad. Also, go listen to the go listen to the Saint Motel song to my enemies because that's the the theme song. For Hell yeah, Bob. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>